Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn in our study of Dante's Inferno now to canto number 8, what we will uh, call the cross, crossing of the river Styx and the access to the city of Dis denied. Um, we will pick up, of course, with the city of Disc in the next canto. So often Inferno 8 and 9 are seen as a unit because we'll have the heretics in the, the Circle 6, the city of Dis. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, my assumption is in the AP folder you've been working with everything we've done from the Iliad, certainly the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. Really important, again, that we know the Aeneid, up and including our study of St. Augustine's Confessions. We also have given uh, detailed lectures already on Cantos 1 through 7. Let's do the quick review of that. Canto 1, of course, we are um, on Good Friday, April 7th, year 1300. Uh, Dante, the pilgrim, is 35 years old. He's lost in a word of error, and Virgil shows up in Canto 2. He will tell um, Dante the reason that he's there is because of Beatrice. In Canto 3, we have, of course, that famous inscription above the gates of hell, abandon hope all ye who enter. We'll get back to that one. In Canto 4, we have Limbo. In Canto 5, we have the Circle 2 of Jacked Lovers, especially Francesca and Paolo. In uh, Canto 6, we have Circle 3, the Gluttons and Chaco. In Canto 7, we have Circle 4. Four, the Prodigals and the Avaricious, as well as Circle 5, the River of Sticks, the Wrathful and the Sullen, which leads us now to uh, the a kind of an interlude as we get ready to uh, meet now Circle, uh, 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 circle uh, 6 and the Heretics. Now, uh, again, our hope is that you're using me after you've read this on your own. Our learning theory is to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and we do that in our learning theory by asking three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? At level two, what's it, what does the text mean? Two A, messages, themes. Two B, we're concentrating on symbolism and irony, and as well, we're asking questions about Dante as poet, philosopher, I'm sorry, politician and philosopher. We're going to see a lot of all three of these in this canto. And then finally, at three, uh, level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in meaningful ways? At three A, uh, relating to the Iliad up through the confessions of, uh, of, of Augustine. And then finally, how can I relate to this information personally? So a real quick brief summary of a book, Canto, that uh, some have argued is maybe the weakest Canto of all of Inferno, and some have argued for an opening line that we'll get to, that maybe the first seven Cantos were written before exile, and that everything afterwards was written during exile. We'll get to why maybe that's the, that's the point. We've got basically two movements. We've got the boat ride with Philegius, um, the, the, um, the ferryman, across the River Styx. And uh, Filippo Argente is going to get jacked, and we're going to have to talk about that. And then finally, we come to the city of Dis and the beginning of Circle Six, um, where the fallen angels will refuse entrance for uh, Dante the Pilgrim and for Virgil. Let's go ahead now and just look at the opening lines of Canto Eight, as we were uh, just suggesting. There's a lot of talk about the fact that maybe that word that begins continuing, in other words, it's almost as if you, I'm picking up. Of course, there's an easy reading of this that says we're just continuing uh, with the story. Continuing, I tell how for some time before we reached the lofty tower's base, our eyes were following two points of flame visible at the top. This is a kind of medieval warfare, a common, a common kind of designator. In answering these, another returned the signal. So we got a signal happening. So far away, the eye could barely catch it. I turned to face my sea of knowledge, the Virgil, and said, Oh, Master, say, what does this beacon mean? And the other fire, what does it signal? And who are they who set it there? Notice again the series of questions. He said, it should be clear. Over these fetid waves, you can perceive what is expected if this atmosphere of marsh fumes doesn't hide it. Bo never drove arrow through air so quickly as then came skimming across the water, a little skiff, guarded by a single boatman at the helm. Now, this will be Philegius, who, of course, we saw in Aeneas 6, line 618 to 620. You'll maybe remember that Philegius has the dubious honor of having his daughter raped by Apollo he decides he's so mad about it that he burns, burns down Apollo's temple at Delphi. And for that, Philegius gets jacked in the inferno uh, or, or in the afterlife of, of Virgil in, in hell. We've always said this is a dark irony in our study, of course, of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and Aeneid. Argued again and again this idea that the gods can do whatever they want to get away with it. Humans, of course, they get jacked. Um, now, evil soul, he cried, you are caught, Philegius. 
And then, Philegius, Philegius, this will be Virgil. Philegius, Philegius, you roar in vain this time, my lord responded. You'll have us in your boat only as long as it takes to cross the fen. Now, this will, of course, be very much like Aeneas 6, 413, and the crossing of, uh, of the river Styx. You'll remember that when Sharon does that crossing of the river, uh, the river Asheron, right, the crossing of the river, you'll remember that there was that beautiful poetic line about how the boat's seams split because of the weight. We're going to have the same game being played here. Um, Virgil will weigh nothing because he's a shade, but of course Dante is not. He's human, and therefore it's gonna it's gonna be a problem. Um, you'll have us in your boat only as long as it takes to cross the fen. And then we've got like one convinced that he has been the butt of gross deception and bursting to complain. Philegius held his wrath. We boarded the boat. My leader first. It bobbed without a sign of being laden until it carried my weight. As soon as we embarked, the ancient prow turned swiftly from shore. It made a deeper cut into the water than it was wont to do with others. In other words, Dante the Pilgrim is heavier. In the, dark, in the dead channel, one rose a beam coated with mud and addressed me. Now, the, the fact that the boat is heavier is what probably is going to be the indicator for Filippo Argente that the, somebody is there. And so he will address with, who are you to come here before your time? And I to him, although I come, I do not come to remain. Then added, who are you who have become so brutally foul? You see me, I am one who weeps, he answered. And I to him, in weeping and sorrow remain, cursed spirit. For I have seen through all that filth, I know you. He started gripping with both hands at the boat. Now, Filippo Agente is going to be one of the black Guelphs of Florence, here, of course, we have political dissension at play. And it'll be interesting that we'll make this comment throughout our study of Inferno. The ways in which Dante the poet has to come to realize that political dissension is the problem in Florence, and there isn't a political answer to this kind of schism, right? Uh, only here, notice already, Dante the Pilgrim is beginning to treat the, the sinners in hell with less compassion and pity, right? He says, he started gripping with both hands at the boat. My master stood and thrust him off saying, back to safekeeping among the other dogs. And then my guide embraced my neck and kissed me on the face and said, indignant soul, blessed indeed is she who bore you. Arrogant in his vice was that one when he lived. In other words, I'm really proud of you that you're finally starting to figure out that instead of pitying these people down here in the underworld, you should be with me uh, jacking them, indignant, right? No goodness whatever adorning his memory. We're talking now about Agente. His shade is furious. Then we get a very compelling line, 46 to 49. You want to put this in your notes. This is a, 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 important lines from Canto 8. In the world above, Virgil says, how many a self-deceiver, now counting himself a mighty king, would sprawl swine-like amid the mire when life is over, leaving behind a name that men revile. In other words, notice... Dante, not poet, but politician, is putting all of Florentine people on notice. If Agente ends up here, I wonder who else will end up in Inferno from Florence. If you're a reader of this poem from Florence, you're probably paying very close attention. Or not even from Florence, right? It might be, for example, Boniface VIII, who's going to be like, ah, oh, there's probably going to be some mention of me in this project. And I said, Master, truly I would like to see that spirit pickled in his swill before we've made our way across the lake. In other words, I'd like to see him really jacked and tortured. And he to me, now Virgil returning, before we see the shore, you will be satisfied for what you seek is fitting. In other words, you are right to want to see these people tortured. After a little, I saw him, Argente, endure fierce mangling by the people of the mud, a sight I give God thanks and praises for. Come, get Filippo Argente, they all cried. And crazed with rage, by the way, this is the first time that his name gets used, right? And crazed with rage, the Florentine spirit bit at his own body. Two observations here. Notice, we said Filippo Agente because, of course, I'm teaching you this poem. But if you're a Florentine reader of this poem, you're, you're reading this going, oh no, oh no, who is it that he's put into the mud of hell that now will be jacked? And here, finally, it is Filippo Argente. And then notice, he ends up even biting himself. By the way, even Boccaccio, the contemporary of, of uh, Dante, um, will have some comments about Argente and his wrathfulness, his rage, his anger. And crazed with rage, the Florentine spirit bit at his own body. Line 60. Let no more be said of him, but that we left him still beset. In other words, we're not going to talk about him anymore. New cries of lamentation reached my ears. Now we're getting ready for dis and, the, and, the, and circle six. And I leaned forward to peer intently out. My kindly master said, 
a city draws near whose name is dis, which of course means not, right? To disqualify means that you don't qualify. A city draws near whose name is dis of solemn citizenry and mighty garrison. I, now Dante the Pilgrim, already clear are mosques. I see them there within the valley, baked red as though just taken from the fire. And he, it is fire blazing eternally inside of them that makes them so appear within this nether hell. Now let's pause for a moment. This will be one of many reasons why we will say postmoderns have great difficulty reading this poem. In other words, for Dante, he is going to put into hell Muslims because, why? Well, they are, of course, infidels. They are heretics. They do not believe in the Christian faith. Of course, the irony is that 200 years later, if Dante had been writing, he would have put Luther there. He would have put Calvin there as a good Catholic, right? This will be one of those challenges of this poem. Here we will find the seeds of a serious philosophic theological question. If you don't like people of another faith, you put them in hell. You burn their mosques, for example. Of course, the easy extension of this idea is, well, if they're going to go to hell anyway and burn in fire, why not just send them there early by burning them in fire now while they're alive, this notion of redemptive violence. And of course, this is the subject of a huge talking point now in the postmodern era about conflict resolution cannot happen this way. The people you don't like or the people who believe differently from you are going to end up in some kind of flaming fires for eternity. If that's the case, then let's just burn them now as heretics or whatever. Of course, we studied our, uh, our, our um, Arthur Miller's de um, um, Crucible last uh, year as juniors. We know all about this paradigm and the way this project works. Of course, this is a talking point. Well, I'll, I'll let you guys debate, right? But notice here we have Muslims in hell, which is interesting because we did have a couple of Muslims in limbo earlier, but of course they were understood to be good Muslims, if you will, right? We had progressed into the deep dug moats that circle near the walls of that bleak city which seemed cast of solid iron. We journeyed on to complete an immense circuit before we reached at last the place where the boatman shouted, Now get out, here's the entrance. Above the gates I saw more than a thousand of those whom heaven had spat like rain all raging. Now these are a thousand of the fallen angels who will have attacked in heaven and been thrown out. Yo, we'll have more to say about this when we get to our Milton's Paradise Lost. Who is this, they, they shout, who is this who'd go without death through the kingdom of the dead? And my wise master made a sign to show that he desired to speak with him aside. So this is the second time in the poem now that Virgil will step off alone away from Dante the poem. He's kind of left there wondering what's going on. And then they tempered their great disdain a bit answering, you by yourself may come inside, but let that other depart who dares set foot within this kingdom. Let him retrace alone his foolish way. Try if he can. And let you remain here who have guided such a one over terrain so dark. In other words, it's time the two of you split up. You can stay. He has to go back all by himself. And then we have Dante the poet who will speak directly to the reader. We'll have this several times in the Divine Comedia. You, judge, oh reader, if I did not lose heart or believe then, hearing that cursed voice, that I would never return from there. In other words, I was horrified at the idea that I was going to have to try and walk out of this place all by myself. Oh, my dear guide, I said, who has restored my confidence seven times over and drawn me out of pearl. Stay at my side. Do not desert me now like this, undone. If we can go no farther, let us instead retrace our steps together. In other words, okay, okay, okay. Hey, if, if we can go any farther, I'm way happy to get out of this place, but I got to get out of this place with you. What do you say? That nobleman, who led me there then told me, Virgil, do not fear, none can deprive us of the passage one has willed for us to have, one being God, although never mentioned in hell. In other words, this is, this is predestined, don't worry, we, we will make this journey, right? Wait for me here and feed your spirit hope and comfort. Remember, I won't abandon you in this nether sphere. So he goes away and leaves me, the gentle father, while I remain in doubt with Yes and no vying in my head. Now this is brilliant stuff if you know your odyssey. You'll remember that between Scylla and Charybdis we said as a symbolic, I'm not sure what to do, a discussion we said of the modern uh, uh, mindset, right? Uh, uh, uncertainty as to what to do. Notice Dante playing the same game with yes and no vying in my head, sick and non, of course, comes to mind with our Aquinas. And as well, we can think about um, uh, our study, as we mentioned it before, of Kierkegaard and the idea that you're stuck between two choices and not sure. What they discuss together, or what my guide uh, proposed, I do not know. Several times in the poem, they're going to they're be talking, and Dante, the poet, will say, I can't, I don't know what happened. All I can tell you is what happened next, right? But they were out of hearing, before they were out of hearing. Before much time, the demon scrambled back where we would go, 
And then I saw our adversaries slam the portals of the entrance of the face of my master. They slammed the, the, the doors of the gates of dis shut right in front of Virgil's face, who remained outside and came back to me, walking slowly with downcast eyes. Uh-oh, even Virgil, at this point, he can't get inside the walls either. We got symbolism going on here. Virgil, who represents intelligence and reason, alone can't go through these gates. It's going to obviously have to have an, the intervention of an angel, right, to be able to do that. His brow devoid of confidence, he said, who has denied me this abode of sighs? And then he said to me, don't be dismayed by my vexation. I will conquer this crew, however they contrive to block our road. Of course, it isn't Virgil that conquers it. It's actually God sending an angel. We'll see this in Canto 9. This insolence of theirs is nothing new. In other words, they, they rebelled against God. Why would I be shocked that they would rebel against you and me? At a less secret gate, They've shown it before, one still unbolted and open. As you know, you read the dreadful inscription that it bore. We're talking, obviously, about Canto 3, right? Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Already on this side of it, down the steep pass, passing the circles without an escort. Be sure, someone is coming to open the city to us. By the way, this is one of the central teachings of the Inferno, right? Someone is coming. That can be read both at the positive as well as at the negative level, right? Okay, let's jump quickly now to level 2 and 3. At 2A, well, ma major messages here. Uh, uh, this idea of someone is coming. I mean, think about this as a central teaching. It can be positive, someone is coming, as in salvation, or someone is coming as in negation, that is to say punishment. Someone is coming and somebody's going to get jacked, right? Another major message is sometimes you can't survive on your own. We've mentioned this already before. You need help. Even Virgil now will need help, right? Reason alone is not enough. Let's put that in our notes. That will be a significant teaching of Dante in this text. Reason is not enough, right? You've got to have, you gotta have love. You've got to have grace. You've got to have the power of God, etc. Notice as well, another message, the deeper Dante goes into hell, the less compassion and pity he feels, and the more he's learning, right, that's taking place, that these people deserve their poor treatment. Now, we as postmodern readers will sometimes say, man, I'm not sure I buy it at all, but this is certainly one of the major messages of this poem, that these people, these souls in hell, get what they deserve because they chose it. That's the point, right? In other words, the argument would be made about Muslims and the mosque that's burning. They could have become Christian. They chose not to become Christian, and therefore they end up in inferno. They end up in hell burning forever. Of course, there, obviously there's some serious theological problems with this idea because uh, any number of other religious faiths can play the same game back, and then you get this eternal conflict over certain kinds of theological premises uh, that become, as we know, the... the the modern world of the 19th and the 20th and now the 21st century, right? At level 2b, well, the symbolism, we've got a lot going on here. Of course, the fallen angels will represent the rebels. Think about this. They are Promethean, if you will. And this, again, is one of those tensions that we've spoken about many times, that school of thought out of uh, Jerusalem with the story of Job, a man who will be tormented even though there's no reason for his tormenting, and he accepts it without really any serious loss of faith, although questioning does occur. And then that school out of Athens, which is, of course, the story of Prometheus, that will say, up yours to deity, I will do what I want to do, provides fire, crucified on a rock, and shouts the F word at God every day, even though he's in tremendous torture. That's the school out of uh, out of Athens. And of course, those are two different schools of thought. And as we have said many times, and we will say again as we get ready now for our study of Shakespeare right after Dante, that's the distinction between the medieval period, best represented by the story of Job, and the Renaissance and the scientific enlightenment to follow, the, a much more Promethean time, right? And this is, of course, in some ways, why moderns will struggle with reading, and moderns and postmoderns, with reading Dante. Because from a Promethean perspective, you constantly are asking, is this right? Is it fair to put the people who don't believe like you, theologically, in an afterlife where they burn in hell? Because is it not true that here we have the beginnings of Holocaust? In other words, if Jews are included in hell because they refuse to believe in Christ, and they're burned, well then why don't we just go ahead and burn them beforehand if God legitimates the burning, we'll burn them as well. And of course we're familiar with the Inquisition and all of that insanity. So in other words, we've got this interesting dynamic in play. Of course, think about the irony. 
Protestants will read this text and go, yeah, yeah, Jews and, and Muslims deserve to get burned. Of course, the irony would be that if Dante had been living 200 years later, you'll remember 1517 and the uh, nailing of the 95 Theses on the wall by Luther, if Dante had been living 200 years later, Luther and Calvin would have ended up, along with Zwingli, in the, uh, in the same inferno. Which, of course, most Protestants would say, no, 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 you've gone too far there. Really? Too far? Um, our, our Muslim friends and our Jewish friends will say, really? Too far? Well, what about, what about our view of this? And, of course, the tension continues. Again, a Promethean reading of this text is going to look at these fallen angels and begin to ask, you know, maybe there's a reason to rebel. The irony, of course, is that the angels should know that they can't fight against, against Virgil because... Obviously, they, they, lost, they lost in being tossed out of heaven, and yet they do it anyway, right? Well, we talk about Dante as poet. He uses Philegius um, at, from Aeneid 6, 6, uh, um, 618 to 620. And, of course, there's all kinds of interesting ironies about the fact that a father has his daughter raped. He does try to fight against the gods, and for that, he gets punished, right? Um, as Dante is politician, well, this is clear. Felipe Agente, two observations here, right? Uh, one is that his name does not get mentioned until much later, right? And then the other one for us is go back to those lines that we read one more time at 4649. I think these lines are worthy of, of review. In the world above, how many a self, how many a self deceiver now counting himself a mighty king? This can be literal rulers or it could be popes, right? Will sprawl swine like amid the mire when life is over, leaving behind a name that men revile. Boy, oh boy, I mean, there is a propedeutic, if ever you need one, instructional that says, oh no, 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 what happens to Felipe Argente here in the beginning of Inferno? We're going to see this all the way, all the way through this poem called Inferno. So sit up and take note. Obviously, a political shot across the bow. If you are a politician in Florence, you obviously right about now are going, oh no, what, who else is he going to put in this poem as we go forward? Well, we've already mentioned that Dante as philosopher, he's, he's raising a very difficult question. This uh, question about alternate views of religious faith. And what do you do with people who don't believe like you?